We are excited to have you this morning. You'll see that it's a little different arrangement than normal. Dr. Jeff Miller is with us. He has been with us Friday and yesterday. Give us some great lessons, such valuable information. Uh, we're not going to take the time to go through his resume to explain to you how well he is prepared to offer us these sessions on Christian evidences, but you will soon know that for yourself. We thank you for joining us this morning. And if you'll bow with me, I'll offer a quick prayer before we turn it over to Dr. Miller. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and thanking you for the time that we're able to spend here this morning and for giving us a safe journey here. We thank you for sending Dr. Miller our way as he is such a valuable servant of yours and it's been such a great joy to have him for these three days. We ask you, dear Lord, to open our hearts and our minds to his lesson. Help us always look to you as the creator and sustainer of this universe, as we ask all of this through your son Jesus' holy name. Amen. Dr. Miller? If you have not been able to be here the rest of the weekend, so much of this material is available at apologeticspress.org in the form of uh, books and articles and so forth. Uh, material yesterday, much of that is covered in my book, Flooded, that you can get there. And, and I those sold out yesterday, the, the, the few copies I was able to bring with me on the, on the airplane. Uh, but you can go check that out at our website, get that material. There's a lot I want to cover during this Bible class hour. So let's dive into the, uh, the topic at hand. Is creation scientifically defensible? And this is kind of the last uh, uh, layer of our uh, tower we've been building this, this weekend. And uh, we'll review that a little bit during the worship hour. And I've been using this uh, debate that occurred 10 years ago, February, as a, uh, a test case to see whether the creation model as I laid it out yesterday, is able to be defended if it is a robust model. And in this debate, Bill Nye, the pseudoscience guy, uh, brought up several different points that I thought were good points that, are, that serve as good test, uh, test examples to see whether or not we can handle uh, what the skeptics have to say about the biblical creation model. So let's go through a few of those. I, I handle these in a more in-depth way and many of the other quibbles he brought up in an article on our website that you can find there. But let's go, let's go through as many of these as we can today. He said, how can the earth be as young as the Bible indicates if you have hundreds of thousands of years worth of layering in the ice cores in Greenland and Antarctica? How do you have trees that can be scientifically dated as being older than the flood and even creation in some cases? How do you have civilizations with a distinct history that goes back beyond Babel and even the flood, uh, when we look at the dates on that, how do you get animals from the ark to remote places like Australia after the flood? How do you get 7,000 species on the ark and then that somehow diversify into the 16 million that we have on the planet today? If that was only 4,000 years ago, that would be 11 new species emerging Every day, he said, and there's not even enough space on the ark for the 7,000 species anyway. How do you do that? And then the ark itself is not even seaworthy, uh, he argues, uh, and, 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 and gives a specific example of a large wooden vessel uh, that was very large and ultimately ended up uh, sinking on the open seas because of its size. All right, let's go, go ahead and wade through these. First of all, his first argument he says that there are hundreds of thousands of years worth of layering in the ice cores in Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, so first of all, we need to understand what an ice core is. This is where scientists will drill down into the ice caps and pull up these big cylinders of ice, and you see these distinct layers in them that form annually. You get a new layer like this that forms annually, and he says we've got hundreds of thousands of these layers in these uh, ice cores in Greenland and Antarctica. How do we explain that? Uh, well, as I've mentioned yesterday, every single old earth method of dating that I've ever seen 
all is based on the principle of uniformitarianism, which, remember, is the idea that whatever you see happening today, whatever rates, accumulation of ice, uh, erosion of canyons, movement of uh, the plates, the tectonic plates, uh, nuclear decay, uh, every dating method that I've ever heard is all based on the principle that whatever is happening today, it's happened that way throughout time, uniformly. That's uniformitarianism. If it is the case, though, that more than one layer could be deposited in a single year, it would destroy the assumption that this is hundreds of thousands of years worth of laying. And, and sure enough, that evidence exists. We see that individual storms and cyclical weather patterns that occur at the poles will cause layers that resemble annual layers. So when you take into account what we would argue in the flood model that I laid out yesterday, what occurred right after the flood that would be very relevant here? Well, the Ice Age. The Ice Age period would have been very significant in explaining why you would have so many layers in single years. In fact, creationists argue as many as a thousand annual layers within each year when the Ice Age really starts picking up. Uh, and remember, the Ice Age lasts for a few hundred years. Now, modern estimates for ice accumulation in Greenland are less than one foot every year, okay? But that estimate, when we go out and actually study the, the actual physical empirical evidence, has that, is that estimate, has that been the same throughout time? Well, even in modern times, we find that that's, it's not really depositing in a uniform way. And one of the reasons we know that is, for example, in 1988, ground-penetrating radar was used to discover the location of some World War II planes from 1942 that had been lost in Greenland. And surprisingly, the planes had been buried under more than 260 feet of ice in accumulation. All right, so do the math on that. That's over five feet of ice forming every year for, the, for 46 years up to the point they had discovered that. So not less than one foot per year. So even in modern times, we see that uniformitarian estimates for ice layer accumulation often does not coincide with the actual observable evidence. So his use of the ice cores to try to prove an old earth doesn't hold ice under scrutiny. Uh, he argued that there are uh, bristlecone pine trees alive today that are as much as 6,800 years old and even a Norway spruce tree, old Chico, that is dated at 9,550 years old. So if, that, if so, these trees would have to have survived the flood and possibly even precede creation week whenever they began forming. So it would appear to be a major problem for the biblical model. So first of all, we need to understand how they date these trees. And so you need to understand what dendrochronology is. Uh, so this is the study of tree rings, not just to find the age of a tree, but tree rings can tell you things about the past, the climate in the past, and whether there were droughts and how much water there was, that sort of thing. But uh, the idea is that each ring is going to coincide with a single year of growth on the tree today. All right, so what's going on here? He mentions old bristlecone pine trees being six to 7,000 years old. And the first thing you need to do if a skeptic comes at you, young people, is go... They need to prove their case. What's he talking about? What, what bristlecone pine trees is he talking about? When you dig into the evidence, the oldest living bristlecone pine tree discovered in 2012 was dated as being 5,062 years old, and it was uh, dated using tree ring counting and cross-dating. Okay, And so that means if that date is correct, it would have started growing around 3,000 B.C. So is that a problem for the creation model? Well, potentially if you have a tree older than when the flood is supposed to have occurred, and the biblical model places the flood as recent as 2300 B.C., based on the chronologies of Genesis 11, coupled with history. That would be 4300 years ago. But as I mentioned yesterday, there's room to expand that number by several years in the chronologies of Genesis 11. we got an article on our website that explains what that's about. And so this already eliminates Bill Nye's argument, but you also have to consider, once again, Uniformitarianism is being assumed in tree ring dating. They're assuming one ring forming per year. And again, we know today that rings don't always correlate with single years when you have unusual circumstances. Uh, rings can form sub-annually. So when you have time-staggered, repeated disturbances caused by, guess what, unusual weather, that has been shown to severely affect tree ring patterns. 
And again, when you think about the implications of the post-flood ice age, which remember would have been triggered by the events of the flood, then this is uh, the perfect situation to uh, have a lot of sub-annual tree rings uh, in a single year. So it's very possible these trees really are younger than they appear from a biblical, from a flood perspective. So where did he even get 6,800 as being the oldest tree? Uh, the oldest living tree. Well, we don't know. It's unclear, and, and, and Ken Ham didn't squeeze him on that. Uh, did he misspeak? Is he talking about not living trees, but dead trees that have been cross-dated? So this is where dendrochronologists will successively overlap uh, tree ring patterns from living back to dead trees and even back to petrified trees to try to uh, coincide the tree ring pattern, get like a history of the trees that goes way back in history. Well, what you find when you study this is this is a very imprecise and oftentimes even subjective way of understanding trees in the past because we, we have t today trees alive in the same forest. You compare their tree ring patterns and they don't match uh, because this is a complicated equation affected by uh, the distance a tree is away from the main water source, the direction the sunlight hits it, soil nutrients, storm patterns. And so this is already a very imprecise way to make an argument. But it's argued you can get a date for the trees going back 8,000 years. So, so even beyond uh, when we would say creation is, which would appear to be a problem for the flood, if that was an accurate way of dating anything. But notice that it's only potentially a problem if you assume all trees, first of all, could not survive the flood. And that is an assumption. The text says all flesh died that moved on the earth. Not, it doesn't mention the plants. In some areas of the planet may have had less turbulence than others. Some trees may have been more robust. We would expect that due to the nature of the pre-flood environment. Trees would have been likely stronger. Uh, Bert Craig of the Department of Horticultural and, and Forestry at Michigan State, he even highlights that many tree species can survive months underwater in flooding conditions. Horticulturalist Whitlow and Harris's monumental work uh, on uh, the effect of flooding on trees, they document dozens of species that are able to survive deep flooding for an entire growing season, even for more than a year. And so if trees survived the flood, either because they survived uh, being underwater or because they were brought on the ark, in some cases with Noah, trees with over 6,000 rings wouldn't even be a problem. But also keep in mind that uh, even if cross-dating could legitimately take you back thousands of years further than the flood and even go back before creation, you have to consider another important part of the model that I laid out yesterday. The Bible implies that the earth, the whole universe, is created with an appearance of age. Adam and Eve were not uh, fetuses or zygotes whenever they're first created. They already are old enough to be able to carry out biology and naming the animals and to procreate and, and to communicate with God and understand the prohibition about the tree and so forth. They're already mature. You would expect there to pinch uh, the starlight from distant stars to already be in place uh, at Earth uh, by day six so that, so that the starlight can be used for the purpose to, uh, stated in Genesis 1.14 to be able to tell human signs, seasons, days, and years. So that light needs to already be in place. It would not have traveled here in a natural way based on the biblical perspective, you might have daughter and parent elements in rocks, therefore giving rocks an appearance of age immediately uh, from the day they were uh, created. And then you would also expect tree rings to exist in the trees. Why? Because they have to already be fully uh, uh, grown and bearing fruit. Why would they need to be bearing fruit? Because Adam and Eve needed to eat that fruit. Okay, so they're already fully mature trees, and therefore they're going to have tree rings. Why? Because tree rings are necessary to uh, sustain the, the size of the big trees. They, they give the strength to the tree to make sure that it won't fall down. So bottom line, tree ages cannot even be conclusively known. And when you're talking about the oldest trees, due to the possibility of subannual uh, tree rings and the mature creation idea and the subjective nature of cross-dating. Now, the one tree he actually gave as a specific example was the Norway spruce, Old Chico, which he said is 9,550 years old. Now, the problem with this is that this was dated using carbon dating, not dendrochronology. So this is typically not even listed among the verified oldest trees. Why? 
Well, because C14 is acknowledged to be notoriously imprecise and subjective beyond a few thousand years, and that's caused in large part due to its foundational assumptions, uh, not only uniformitarianism and some other uh, assumptions I actually looked at yesterday with you, but also in this particular dating method, there's the assumption of the effect of the Earth's magnetic field on the production rate of C14. You don't even want to know all this, but uh, anyway, they now know the, the assumptions that are used for C14 dating uh, don't hold in the past on Earth based on their model, and so they reject that idea. No wonder archaeologist Brian Fagan of UC Santa Barbara, he actually came out and said carbon dating is not infallible in general. Single dates should not be trusted. Uh, and so tree ages simply can't be used to disprove the creation model. All right, number three. According to Bill Nye, you know, there are, there are human populations that are far older than that, Babel and the Flood, with traditions that go back farther than that. Okay, now if that's true, that would seem to contradict the biblical perspective on the flood and what happens there, because all civilizations should have been annihilated at the flood, and then they start again, starting at Babel. Only those civilizations that emerge at that point should have distinct traditions like that. All right, so how do we respond to this? Well, first of all, I have to ask once again, what civilizations was he talking about? Because he doesn't tell us, right? He just throws that out there, insinuations, it's not actual evidence. So we're left to guess and make his argument for him, which isn't ever a good idea in a debate. Is he talking about China? Well, you look into the Chinese history, you find you've got records that go back to only 1600 B.C., and beyond that it's just uncorroborated legend that exists. So Chinese history can't be said to pose a problem with any certainty. Is he talking about Sumer? 2700 B.C. is the date for the earliest known Sumerian king. And the Sumerian language is said to be the oldest written language. It's claimed to date back to 3100 B.C. But notice, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica, the chronology of the first half of the third millennium is, notice, largely a matter for the intuition of the individual author. Carbon-14 dates are at present too few and far between to be given undue weight. Consequently, the turn of the fourth to, to third millennium is to be accepted with due caution and reservations as the date of the invention of writing. So even the date 3100 is speculative, and even if it is right, it still falls after possible flood date estimates, which can be as high as 3500 B.C. or more. Is he talking about Egypt? Scholars estimate 3100 B.C. to be the commencement of the first Egyptian dynasty, and again, that can't be known conclusively for the same reason as Sumer. Uh, when you consider the inexact nature of tree ring dating, pottery comparison, C14 dating, and, and historical uh, records. And so some scholars argue that date can be collapsed a few hundred years into the 2000s B.C. But either way, all of these dates from China, Sumer, and Egypt can fit within the biblical model. So this doesn't disprove the Bible at all. His claims don't carry any weight. But I do notice an interesting pattern here. The oldest living tree is thought to date back to 3100 B.C. The Egyptian dynasty goes back to about 3100 B.C. The origin of the written language in Sumer goes back to about 3100 B.C. with no verifiable civilizations before that time. What does that tell you? Uh, that's exactly what we would predict to be the case if the flood in Babel happened. Something significant seems to have happened immediately prior to that event, and there's this explosion of uh, life and civilization going on after that. So the post-story of the flood is being verified in multiple independent directions, which is actually a powerful argument uh, for our side of the aisle. Number four, if there was a flood, how do the animals get to Australia once they leave the ark? So all the animals on the planet get wiped out, and somehow you have to get the kangaroos out there to Australia after they leave the ark. How's that going to happen? Well, first of all, keep in mind, if this is a problem for creation, is guess who it's also a problem for? I mean, how do you get animals out there to Australia, even if you're an evolutionist? So they would be in a fix to try to say, oh, well, they just evolved from their own single-celled organism out there, and they don't make that argument. So how do you get the animals out there, and whatever you come up with, why wouldn't that be legitimate for creationists as well? Number two, Bill Nye summarily dismissed the idea of there being a land bridge connecting Asia with Australia. He just blew that off like that's not even a possibility, and yet he wasn't taking into account really what the, the truth of the matter on the, the possibility of land bridges. The water between those islands can be misleading. So if you notice this map of the Pacific Sea floor, that the continental shelf of China 
actually extends all the way down to the continental shelf of Australia with just a relatively small gap between them. So again, keep in mind what the flood model would argue during the Ice Age. You've got more of the, the sea in the form of uh, ice caps, which lowers the, whole, the, uh, the uh, sea level uh, uh, worldwide, right? And so a lot of this, uh, this shelf could have been exposed during the Ice Age period which would have made it easier to jump for animals to go all the way down this string, for example, of islands and basically get down there to Australia. Now, another option, remember the creation model, is we would even predict the idea, really, of Pangaea, the idea that all the continents were at one time crammed together. We just have a problem with the date of when that would have occurred and how fast the movement has happened since then. We looked at that yesterday. Uh, remember, Genesis 7.11 seems to allude to this Possibly this idea, uh, I mean, uh, back in Genesis 1, it alludes to this one. It says, all the water is gathered into one place. And well, what does that imply about the land? It may have been gathered together into one place. And remember, Genesis 7.11 says, all the founts of the great deep are broken up, which could be uh, implying the breakup of the actual ocean floor in the beginning of plate tectonics. So we looked at that yesterday. And so bottom line is the plate, the uh, continents would have been much closer together uh, right after the flood, which would have made it easier for animals to traverse that distance. Uh, also keep in mind, you know, we, so we would say that plate movement, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, was much faster on the order of meters per second uh, during the flood and still uh, a lot quicker immediately after the flood. And um, is there evidence to suggest that? Looked at, we looked at a lot of evidence yesterday. But it is interesting that there has been some... Uh, uh, recent research by Yale University where they have documented that sure enough the, the movement of the plates was much faster in the past. Here's what they, they highlight in their research. These observations suggest that either non-uniformitarian, right, so catastrophic plate tectonics or an episode of rapid true polar wonder occurred when? During the Cambrian explosion of animal life. Remember when I said the flood started based on the, the creationist uh, model during the Cambrian. That begins the flood. And they're saying, we're finding evidence that the plates are moving much faster at that point. So this actually fits with what we're saying. But um, <clears throat> bottom line is these plates would have been a lot closer to each other at that time, making it easier to traverse these distances. But we've got other options to consider as well. Of course, because of the post-flood ice age, you would have had uh, ice allowing you to traverse uh, to various places that aren't available today, like the Bering Strait. We know that the English Channel was iced over during the, uh, uh, during the Ice Age, which would have allowed migration there. Now, another plausible option, there would have been, if you think about it, no doubt, de the dead pre-flood forests would have been floating on the water after the flood happened. Now, is it possible that animals would have been on these floating forests? Well, before you just write that off, uh, this is a picture from 2012 of Spirit Lake near Mount St. Helens. It's 32 years after the 1980 eruption, and this, uh, this floating log mat is still there from that catastrophic event. Notice this image from the Telegraph. This is a popular newspaper of the United Kingdom. Notice the title of the article, Massive floating rubbish islands from the Japan tsunami back there in 2011 are spotted uh, on the uh, Pacific. All right, this is a picture of that island floating across the Pacific towards the U.S. west coast. And this particular debris island from this single tsunami is 69 miles long and it covers an expanse of 2.2 million square feet. All right, now notice this picture. And in the description, it explains that members of the Japan Coast Guard found and rescued that dog from this debris island, from that tsunami, three weeks after the tsunami. So for three weeks, it's out there on this island chilling and still alive all that time until somebody comes out there and rescues it. So this is not at all outlandish to suppose that you could have had massive debris islands found all over the world and that animals could have been on these floating immediately after the flood, and has added evidence of the legitimacy of that. Recent genetic analysis suggests that the marsupials, like the kangaroos in Australia, originated in South America. How did they get from South America to Australia? 
Well, when you look at the projections of what the ocean currents would have looked like in the Paleocene and the Oligocene period after the flood, you see there would have been an ocean current moving from South America to Australia. And in fact, ocean currents are argued to be how you get creatures from South America to the famous Galapagos Islands that Darwin studied. That's one of the arguments they use to explain how you get the creatures out there. So this isn't an outlandish idea. So if a, if a tsunami in one small area of the world could make a floating island that's that big, what in the world would a global flood do? I mean, you could have had continent-sized uh, plant islands uh, floating out there with animals on there. Now, of course, you got one other final possibility of how you get animals to Australia that the evolutionists don't have, and that is humans could have carried them. Okay, humans are around that whole time, and so they could have carried the animals out there to Australia on boats and so forth. Number five, according to Bill Nye, we got 16 million species today. And if you got 7,000 on the ark 4,000 years ago, that would require 11 completely new species emerging every day since the flood. And I got to admit, when I heard that, I was like, wow, that's a, that's a good point. How do we explain that? And uh, once again, though, there's never any reason, young people, there's never any reason to distrust what the Bible says. The, the, no matter what argument they bring up, the, it doesn't disprove the fact we've already proven there's a God. We've already proven the Bible's inspired. We can know that separately. So now the question is just how to explain these little quibbles. None of this disproves the inspiration of the Bible. We know the flood happened. The question, this just becomes an interesting idea. Okay, well, how do we explain this? It doesn't disprove anything. This argument doesn't disprove the scientific foreknowledge of the Bible, the predictive prophecy of the Bible. All that is still substantiated, the inspiration of the Bible. So what's going on here? Well, first of all, he is correct in his representation of at least one thing about the flood model. We don't claim that all of the current animal varieties, or even necessarily all the species, were on the ark. Not every single species of the dog, for example, uh, were on the ark. We argue what the text says. You know, species is a modern concept invented by humans. We argue what the text says, different, the different kinds of are represented on the ark. Genesis 6.20, we talked about that yesterday. So this would be perhaps a representative of the dog kind from which came all those domestic dog breeds and also the wolves, foxes, jackals, coyotes, dingoes, all of this would have come about from the proto-dogs that would have been on the ark. And the same goes for every other basic kind. There's probably a single cat kind from which came all of the variety we have today and as well as the Smilodon from the Ice Age. The elephant kind, creation scientists have nailed down, includes your woolly mammoths and your mastodons. There would have been a single representative of these guys on the ark. Uh, the camels, notice actually the camel kind includes even the llamas and the alpacas. So there's a single representative that brought these varieties. All the bears that we have, including the extinct bears, are thought to be uh, all part of the single bear kind that would have been represented on the ark uh, from a single um, pair, uh, for example, of those. And something more like, remember, the modern taxonomic category of family or genus is what we're talking about. And so there's no need to fit every single modern species on the ark, which would be difficult if not impossible. And no need to, since many different species within a kind could come about through some kind of diversification process, microevolutionary change, for example. And so there would have been representatives from each kind that had the genetic material in their genome uh, that would allow them to have the, so this is called the inheritable variability, remember, to allow them to produce all the diversity of creatures that we see within those kinds today. So, it's true, from those original kinds, those proto-species, all of the variety we see today has to emerge through some kind of rapid diversification process. So Bill Nye said that there were 7,000 proto-species on the ark. He said he was quoting uh, Ken Ham. We don't really know for sure that it was 7,000. Currently, we're estimating more like 1,400, uh, and, and a lot of baromenologists are studying this topic, but it could be more, could be less. So here's what Bill Nye said. So you'd go out into your yard, right? Here's a scoffer. Here's an example of a scoffer I talked to you guys about yesterday, 2 Peter 3. Scoffers are going to come, and they're going to scoff about the flood. Peter tells you that. So you go out into your yard, you wouldn't just find a different bird, a new bird. You'd find a different kind of bird, a whole new species of bird every day. And this would be enormous news. I mean, the last 4,000 years, people would have seen these changes among us. We see no evidence of that. There's no evidence of these species. And remember, notice this scoffing attitude. And it pressures you. It makes you feel like, oh, yeah, I don't want to be an idiot here, so I better change what I'm thinking. When really all you got to do is dig in and see what's going on here. 
And as usual, <laughs> you find there's a totally legitimate explanation for what's going on. Even though on the surface this seems intimidating. Well, so first of all, once again, we've got to ask, where is he getting 16 million for the number of species today? He throws that out there and he doesn't prove it. Remember, this is what the first rule of dealing with a skeptic is make them prove what they're talking about. There's a lot of disagreement among biologists about how many species there are today, but that number is ridiculously high. And in fact, some estimates are as low as 2 million, including an estimate published by Science Magazine back in 2013. Uh, one study from 2011 estimates that there are uh, not 16, but 10,960,000 and that estimate includes not only the kingdom Animalia, but also plantae, fungi, protozoa, chromista, archaea, and even bacteria. And keep in mind, these are just estimates. The actual catalog number of species on the planet, 2011, 1,438,769. They're projecting, eventually we're going to find 10,960,000. Now, also, Bill Nye needs to be sure to accurately reflect what the biblical model claims. Okay, so from that 11 million, that you, you need to now subtract marine creatures, right? They're not going to be on the ark. You remove ocean-dwelling creatures, that brings you down under 9 million, and possibly other creatures could survive in water that could be removed. The amphibians, for example, aren't necessarily included, like in the creeping things, but we'll leave them in there for the sake of argument. The plants... The text doesn't mention plants being taken onto the ark. They're not flesh, other than those that uh, the passengers would eat. So that brings you down under 8.5 million. Now, incidentally, again, would the plants have died in the flood if they're not taken on the ark? And no doubt many would have. It would have been on these continents of material floating around, but not necessarily all the plants. Interestingly, most of the planet's plants are underwater today. Uh, but also, seeds could have been brought on the ark, and perhaps more likely... You've got to consider all the seeds that would have been available on all, on all these dead plants floating on the water. All right, what happens when the flood waters recede? Well, a lot of those plants are going to go right back down and then re-germinate. And in fact, studies show seeds can survive submersion in salt water for extended periods of time. And ironically, guess who even conducted a study like that to prove that? Charles Darwin. Next. Synonymous species. This is where you have two names given to the same species. So creatures originally thought to be two distinct species, they're now considered to be one and the same, or one creature whose name has changed over time, and yet both names were unintentionally counted. So the, the PLOSB paper highlighted this weakness in species estimates, and they explained that a survey of 2,938 taxonomists with expertise across all major domains of life revealed that synonyms are a major problem at the species level, and they believe that 17.9% of those named species could be synonyms and possibly as much as 46.6%, almost half of them, okay? Uh, the World Register of Marine Species documents that 44.5% of all accepted marine species are synonyms. All right, so let, just for the sake of argument, let's take the lowest number here, 17.9%. If we say 17.9% of the remaining species are synonyms, that now brings us down under 7 million. Notice this is a far cry from 16 million. All right? Now, if the flood was 4,500 years ago instead of 4,000, which is closer to our estimate, that brings us down to four species emerging every day, not 11. Now, if there are fewer species than the projections, which is very likely, if there are more synonyms, which is basically uh, definite, more years since the flood, which is possible, more species that could survive outside of the ark, which is certain, and more representative kinds on the ark, which is also very possible, then that number continues to plummet, and yet we're still not done. Insects, other invertebrates, fungi, bacteria, protozoa, these are all included in that 11 million species estimate, even though many of those are not going to be on the ark. Invertebrates, for example, make up 95 to 99% of the planet's animal species. Insects alone make up about half of the remaining 6.9 million species. And of course, the Bible doesn't say anything about these. Many of these could have survived outside of the ark, significantly reducing the remaining list. Uh, although some creeping things might be, uh, include some of the insects, but this seems to be mainly talking about uh, the reptiles when you look at that description, for example, in Leviticus. 
And all, now of those that are left, you keep in mind the fast reproductive rates of those smaller creatures. There's a correlation between how many species there are of the smaller creatures versus the bigger. And what we find is that the smaller creatures tend to be able to reproduce faster, which allows for diversification faster. Uh, flies can have as many as 100 eggs uh, a day. According to the American Society of Microbiology, one bacteria can produce 10 billion in 10 hours. Is that creepy? <laughs> Uh, so many new species could have been rapidly diversifying in the, in the years immediately after the flood, which would have then slowed down to a certain extent because of, for example, niche conservatism. All right, so bottom line, 11 new species is nowhere near a fair, accurate assessment of the data. Even four would be a huge overestimate, and most of those would be tiny creatures, completely unnoticed by humans, even though he said, surely we would have noticed this happening. Now also consider, the Earth has a volume of over one trillion cubic kilometers, and humans only inhabit a tiny space of the Earth, comparatively. And so we're not in a position to know what all is going on in and on the Earth. And so the odds that a species would happen to emerge in your backyard, a new species, much less that it would be large enough for you to notice it, is basically zero. And interestingly, in spite of that, here's the ironic thing. According to the literature, scientists are still discovering 15,000 new species that we've never noticed every year. They're not necessarily emerging every year, but they haven't noticed them before. A new species. So to us, it could be that they emerge. We really don't know. So guess how many newly discovered species that averages out to every day? 41. 41 new species are being discovered every day. Number six, according to Bill Nye, the National Zoo requires 163 acres just to exhibit 400 species. So how can the ark hold 14,000 animals? Now again, this is not even certain whether 14,000 would be a good estimate of the representative proto-species on the ark, but uh, let's go with it for the sake of argument. Number one, the ark and the zoo aren't a good parallel, are they? I mean, the ark isn't about display. This is about just basic shelter, and keep in mind these are going to a better parallel would be more like a, a factory farm or high-density housing facility that can house uh, tens of thousands of animals in tight quarters under a single roof. Also, if the cubit is 18 inches, as many scholars will estimate, so the length from the elbow to the, to the tip of the middle finger, the arc would have been 450 feet long, so a football field and a half long by 75 feet uh, wide, 45 feet high. So creation geologist and biologist John Woodmorath, he did an extensive study on how much space would be required to house 16,000 animals, not just 14,000. Uh, so this is representative of each of the genus and taking into account food, water, waste disposal, heating, ventilation, lighting. And he found the ark was more than adequate in size to house that number of animals on that size ark. Also consider... What if humans were generally larger in the pre-flood era due to better health, life longevity, and keeping in mind the enormous reptiles and plants of the pre-flood world that we looked at yesterday? Uh, remember a few centuries right after the flood, you've got that uh, massive uh, cluster of grapes that had to be carried by two men on a pole It's so big. And we also uh, saw that you have giants in the pre-flood world, and we see, for example, remember Homo heidelbergensis I talked about yesterday, which is a, a race of the humans that are huge and may be representative of early man immediately after the flood. So what if the cubit is larger than 18 inches at that time, which some estimates actually make it? If you have just a 25-inch cubit instead of an 18-inch cubit, it more than doubles the volume of space on the ark, brings it up from one and a half million to 4 million cubic feet. And of course, you would also reason that the animals would likely be juveniles. Remember, because smaller animals, of course, are going to take up less space, they're going to eat less food, uh, make less waste, and more importantly, they're going to live longer after the flood, allowing them to spread out and repopulate the earth uh, after the flood, which would have been very important. So bottom line, plenty of space for many, many animals. Bill Nye's criticism doesn't disprove the Bible. It actually gives it another chance to shine and show that the Bible is inspired. Uh, what about the dinosaurs? Would they have been on the ark? Uh, we talked about this briefly yesterday. Creation scientists know with a high level of confidence where the flood begins in the fossil record of the geologic column down at the base of the Cambrian, and we find the dinosaurs up above that, and they're alive because we find their footprints. 
uh, which means as land-dwelling creatures, they would have been represented on the ark. But you have to keep in mind, first of all, the average size of even an adult uh, dinosaur is about the size of an American bison. And number two, these would have been juveniles, most likely, and even the sauropods, the big long neck, long tail dinosaurs, start in an egg about this big, of which I have a replica or two at, at AP. All right, so this isn't even the dinosaurs aren't a problem. All right, number seven, he says, how can the ark be seaworthy, a vessel that's that, that big, a big wooden vessel, when we have a specific example of a large wooden vessel, not even that big, uh, that ultimately uh, sank on the open seas due to the tendency of those long wooden planks to twist and buckle, and ultimately it, it sank because of that. Uh, and so how do you explain a vessel that's even larger? Well, first of all, as with the ark and a zoo, the Wyoming and the ark aren't a good parallel because the Wyoming had six masts and several sails, which would have created immense torsion from the wind filling these sails on the open seas. It's definitely going to cause twisting and buckling. I can't believe that Bill Nye even made this argument. He's a mechanical engineer. Uh, the ark, of course, wouldn't have had sails because it didn't have anywhere to go. And so the torsion problem uh, would have been greatly reduced. It's really not a good parallel. But also, interestingly, we have found large ancient wooden ships that date back to immediately after the flood in Egypt that are equipped with a sophisticated interlocking plank system called the mortise and tenon joint, which was one of the things that, that, that this joint does is help prevent uh, twisting. Uh, this is one of the valuable things of this type of, uh, of uh, uh, a joint, and yet we find this on the ancient sea vessel. By the way, that's a Interesting concept, too. The pre-flood world we talked about yesterday could have been very technologically advanced when you take into account the long lifespans, the less genetic entropy that is affecting us now, this many uh, years removed from uh, the Garden of Eden. God would have created the human genome and brain pristine and perfect. They could have been highly intelligent, doing amazing things. The only technology that survives is what you'd expect. Sea uh, shipbuilding, civil engineering type things that Noah and his children both would have brought with them into the post-flood world, and you find evidence of these things right after the flood. Amazing technology that we don't even understand how they can do these things, and it's because it would have been brought with, from the pre-flood world, that knowledge. So seaworthy large wooden ships were not a problem. And number three, no one knows what gopher wood was, and God was very specific in choosing this as the wood for the ark. And keep in mind that Moses mentions other very specific species of wood that we know what they are in the Pentateuch. Terebinth, green poplar, almond palm, willow, olive fig, pomegranate, chestnut are all mentioned in the Pentateuch. And, and many others mentioned in Scripture outside of the Pentateuch. And God chose this mysterious gopher. And there is no modern, we know there's not going to be a modern equivalent to this, whatever it is. Because you've got to keep in mind what has gone on over the years. You have genetic entropy. Right? We talked about this as part of the important part of the flood model, the biblical model, and it's talked about there in, in Hebrews 1, for example. The whole Everything's decaying, everything is getting old. And so even the species, it's not just our species, but all the species of the planet are decaying from de genetic entropy. And so there would not be a modern parallel to what the gopher wood even, even would have been. And so it's highly unlikely that there's, there's any kind of equivalent wood, and, and yet this wood was specifically chosen because it was conducive to God's instructions for the ark. Is it possible that this wood would have been particularly good at resisting, twisting, and buckling? No doubt it was. That's the reason why the great engineer would have said this is the wood to use. Number four, notice the Wyoming, in spite of its problems, still stayed afloat for 15 years. And the ark only needed to stay afloat for a few uh, months. So bottom line, Bill Nye doesn't show that the ark was seaworthy, uh, unseaworthy. He, quite the contrary, he once again is showing the creation model is actually a great model. And uh, interestingly also, the dimensions of the ark have been shown to produce uh, seaworthy vessels. The SS Great Britain, for example, in service back in the 1800s had a dimension ratio of 322 to 51 to 32, almost exactly that of the ark. Uh, the SS Jeremiah O'Brien and the other uh, ugly ducklings from World War II, these were, these were more like the Ark. These are cargo ships. They're not built for speed or combat. This is just to transport a lot of weight through the harsh sea. And again, if you look at what the, uh, the dimensions were of these and make the conversion from uh, cubits to feet with regard to the Ark, you see that the Ark is very similar to what these vessels are. They line up. And then you have... Um, 
The most recently designed super jumbo barges, which again are better parallel to the ark. Their purpose is to stay afloat and transport immense amounts of cargo. And again, you have a very similar dimension ratio. Uh, the very large crude oil carriers, the VLCC, again, uh, same kind of purpose here. We're talking about huge weight, open sea, and once again, we're finding clearly somebody knew what they were doing when designing the ark. I mean, they, it, whoever this is seemed to have known about marine engineering and the best way to do this. And so this actually is one of the evidences of the Bible's inspiration. Okay, this is no amateurs working here on this vessel. So... Bottom line is, Bill and I brought up all these points, and the creation model cannot withstand scrutiny on any of this, and so you all just need to give it up. I don't know why you're here. Uh, you can't trust the Bible, right? Okay, that's just not true. Bill Nye is the pseudo-science guy. That's the solution here. See, the pseudo-science guy. Thank you for your attention, and we'll go ahead and break.